If you've been watching this channel for a while, you will have heard me say that when I discovered Darktable in 2016, one of the things that blew me away was the masking, but more specifically, the parametric masking. What you can do with this tool is simply game-changing stuff. Let's get into it. Hi, and welcome to episode 110 of Understanding Darktable. Like I said, the parametric masking is just amazing stuff. You can build a mask for any image based on the hue, the saturation, the luminosity, or any combination thereof. That's pretty powerful stuff. And when I left Adobe Prison in 2016, Lightroom had nothing like this built in. Whether it does today, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I haven't looked at it in six years. So, you know, fill me in if they've actually caught up. Uh, yeah, let's just dive in. What I've done for the purposes of this video is downloaded a graphic of a color test pattern, basically, uh, from somebody who calls himself the original net man. I don't know who that is or was. He obviously created this in 2011. Uh, but when I saw it on Google image search results, I thought, yep, this will do the trick for what I need to, you know, demonstrate with regards parametric masking. Now, before we dive into that, one thing I do want to quickly revisit, I'm pretty sure I covered this in 108, but I want to revisit it again just in case I didn't, and that is the concept that there are modules in Darktable which use a display referred algorithm for their processing. And we are trying to move away from that and using the newer modules which use a scene referred algorithm. If you don't understand what those terms are, don't stress. I've done a video on it. You'll have to search for it because I don't remember what number it was. But you can always find out what particular algorithm a module uses by simply mousing over the header, wait for the pop-up, and you'll see the second line that says input linear RGB scene referred. So big green tick for the tone equalizer. If we look at RGB curve, Second line, input, linear, RGB, display referred. Big red cross for the RGB curve. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't use these modules. It just means that the color science behind them is not going to yield results as good as any of those modules which use scene referred algorithms. But for the purposes of this video, I am actually going to use the RGB curve to demonstrate. Let's suppose I want to create something crazy like a, a darkening curve like so. At the moment, that curve is affecting every pixel in the image. And at the moment, we don't have any masking turned on at all. If I wanted to create a parametric mask, and we will come to why I want to do that in just a sec, I would click on the fourth icon there for parametric masks. Now, I mentioned the whole display referred versus scene referred algorithms for the way that the module works. I do want to stress the module can work in one way and the masking can be calculated another way. And you'll notice that the very rightmost icon on the masking options bar there is blending options. And if you click on that, you will see that in almost every module, you'll at least see both RGB display referred and RGB scene referred. And if it's an old module that uses the lab color space, you will also see lab on this pop-up menu as well. Where possible, change to the RGB scene referred option. What that means is it's not going to change the way the actual module is processing. In other words, the RGB curve but it will change the way in which the mask is calculated. And the scene referred algorithm will create smoother looking masks than either scene, uh, sorry, RGB display referred or lab. So just bear that in mind. Okay, so now I've activated the parametric masking for this particular image. But at the moment, the module, the RGB curve, is still processing every pixel in the image. And we can check that by turning on the mask. And as we can see, 
the whole thing becomes yellow to signify that every pixel in this image is being processed by the RGB curve module. Now, let's suppose this row of highly saturated rectangles down here at the bottom, let's say we wanted to isolate those. So our RGB curve was only affecting those rectangles only. Now, the fact that they are highly saturated gives us a clue. So what we would do is go to the CZ channel, that's our saturation, and we want to exclude from the mask any pixels which have low saturation values. So we simply click and drag, and we can see that certain pixels are now being excluded from the mask, but we're not seeing the mask. So maybe we should turn the mask on. So we'll turn that on. We can now see that anything that's still yellow is going to get processed by this RGB curve. Anything that's not yellow is essentially bypassing the RGB curve module. So we want to keep dragging this until we've only got that row of rectangles at the bottom. But what's happened? I've dragged those lower controls all the way to the right, and I still have a bunch of stuff selected that I didn't need. This is where the boost factor comes in. The boost factor will only appear for sliders or, or controls where it actually makes sense for them to be. And that is part of the scene referred algorithm. Because with scene referred, you can have values greater than 100%. Again, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now. But what this allows us to do is to increase the boost factor and we can see our lower value triangles are now sliding back down the range. And what that means is we can now take them from 100% to something higher until we start losing the bits you know, that we want to exclude. Now, what I see straight away at this point is most of these rectangles are still in the mask, but this one here has already been excluded. That tells me that the original Netman didn't do a particularly good job of creating this color test pattern, because if he had, these six rectangles all would have had an identical saturation value. You get what you pay for, I guess. Okay, so we're gonna drag this back down until that rectangle came back into the the mask for us. Okay, that's good. Now we can maybe work on removing anything that's more saturated, but I don't think there is anything. No, not really. Okay, we got rid of a lot of stuff, but we've still got a lot in the image that we don't want. What we could now do is also look at the luminosity values. Maybe we can discard certain luminosities and get closer to just ending up with the row that we want. So let's try it. We'll start, oh, we're already losing some, like, why would that have a boundary around it that stands out? Man, what was this guy doing? Oh, oh, amateur hour. Okay. So, nope, can't do that either. Nope. Okay. In this particular instance, I think it would probably make more sense to either use a drawn mask on its own and just create a big rectangle, or use a drawn and parametric mask. But that's not the subject of this video. That'll be the subject of the next video. So you're just going to have to suffer through. So I'm going to give up on this quest because clearly I'm not going to get what I'm after with just parametric masking for that particular row of rectangles. But let's get a little bit more nuanced, shall we? Let's suppose I just wanted this purple rectangle and nothing else. I'm actually going to go back and reset the saturation. So now the entire image is being processed. Now we want to go by hue, and I will use the eyedropper to select that color. 
And we can see that on our color slider here, there's a little vertical gray bar. And that tells me exactly where that particular value of magenta appears on this color bar. So now I can simply bring these triangles in until we're really, really close. Turn on the mask. We can see that we're reasonably close. We're, we're getting there. This is where I would love to be able to zoom in on the color bar here, or at least be able to double click on these text values and enter precise values. Sadly, I can do neither. But we've got this as close as I think I'm going to get, just targeting hue. Now, let's add saturation. All right, getting there. Again, what's with the, the bar around the edge of that rectangle that appears like a black line? It's like, oh, seriously? Whatever. Okay, so we've got close. We've still got a few pixels that we didn't want. Let's try luminosity. Can we get rid of anything else? Yep, we got rid of some more. That's good. Yep. Yep, Oop. and now we've gone a bit far, so back to about there. Okay, we've gone pretty close to getting just the one rectangle that we wanted by using a combination of hue to target just the color we want, targeting just the saturation values that we want, and targeting just the luminosity that we want. Now, like I said, in 2016, Lightroom had nothing on that. Nothing at all. Whether it does today, I don't know. All right. Couple of other things to note. When you are targeting the luminosity channel in particular, I'm just going to reset this. You can click the A key when you have already clicked on this uh, set of controls. You can click on the A key and you'll see that input changes to logarithmic. Normally it's linear. Where that will come in handy is when you are trying to narrow down to very dark luminosities on their own, click that A key and now suddenly your luminosity scale is logarithmic and you can target much deeper values with far greater accuracy than you would be able to do with the input slider in a linear display uh, type of scenario. Okay, so let's just dial that luminosity back to where we wanted it, which was somewhere around about here. Turn our mask display off. And as we can see, this magenta rectangle and that little bit on the tail end of that color swatch there are the only parts of the image now being processed by that RGB curve. Once you start looking at real world images, this is just mind blowing stuff. Very quickly, let's have a look at our 39 Hudson again. You've seen me do this trick in another video. If I wanted to recolor the car, I could simply go to my color balance RGB module, turn that on, and I will activate a parametric mask. I will make sure that my mask is RGB scene referred, which I don't really need to check because I know that the color balance RGB module uses scene referred algorithms anyway. So we're good. Now I am going to target the range of hues with the second eyedropper. So I'm just going to drag across a range of pixels there. So that has targeted my hue for me. However, I do know that the range of reds that are included in this paintwork actually spans both ends of this color bar. So the way to do that is to go something like this where I go I'm excluding those reds and I'm excluding those reds 
and then toggle the polarity of those triangles, which will do that. So now I'm excluding everything in between and I'm just keeping what's on the outside edges. And if we have a look at our mask, you can see we've gone pretty close to getting just the car. There is still a bit of extraneous stuff that we don't want. We can try tweaking the parameters for these triangles. We're starting to lose some reds there. Come in from this end. Yet we're starting to lose some stuff there as well. So we just back that off. We'll go to the saturation and see how we go there. Whoa, that was immediately beneficial. Bring that back just a touch to somewhere around about there. Luminosity. I'm not sure if that's... Yeah, no, we're going to start losing valid pixels pretty quickly there. We can try from the top end down. Oh, yeah, that works a little bit. So, again, with the combination of those three sliders, we have pretty quickly dialed in to just picking up the paintwork of the car. So we didn't have to go through all of that painstaking stuff that we did in App 109 of trying to draw paths. Game changer, right? So we turn our mask off and now we come up to the controls for our color balance. I go, well, I want to change the hue of the car. Okay, I want to go all ZZ Top and make it purple. Yeah, now you're talking. No, maybe I want blue. Maybe I want olive green, you know? This is just one execution. Hopefully this has given you enough of an understanding about how the parametric masks work that you can start employing these techniques on your images. Like I said, the next episode where we look at drawn and parametric masks together is going to blow your mind because you can really do some amazing stuff. There's probably a heap more I could have covered even in this episode, uh, but hopefully this has given you the basic grounding to, to move forward. All right, guys. Questions, comments, feedback, sing out down below, and I'll catch you in the next one.